in terms of as you've been an imam for two years now or three years? Three years. Three so years. Yeah, it was a three year experience. Uh, and obviously, I'm speaking about the UK context. Hmm. Obviously, I'm not sure how the American context would be. Maybe slightly, slightly different. Allahu alam. Because of obviously, because we're from London, uh, I want to focus on that. Now, generally, with our masajid, we're seeing that they're not really progressing for mm. numerous reasons. All right. And in your opinion, given the experience that you've had, what would you say are the main, main reasons for this? Mm. Okay, so I think the, for, you're speaking from purely from a, a, a British perspective. I mean, you have to go back and see how our mosques were first established. You'll find that an overwhelming majority of masajid that were established weren't actually established by what you would call the practicing community. Uh, they weren't established by scholars, which I think sadly reflects the state of maybe scholarship and uh, the state of people who seek knowledge in, 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 uh, in the West. Mm. Because in, at the end of the day, really, I mean, ideally, in an ideal situation, these people should be at the forefront of establishing Islamic institutions and masajid. Mm. But the reality is, and I think because obviously this is to do with the demography and um, of, of, of the Muslims in the West, because obviously, you know, we have a few generations now of Muslims uh, in, the, in the UK. And so our parents, you know, our, our grandparents' generation, you could say perhaps, were the first sort of generations that came, first sort of generation that came to, to, to the UK. So, and, and there wasn't, you know, large, you can say, maybe practicing communities, if you can say that. There were people that were devout in the sense that there were people who were deeply concerned about their religious identity. They were concerned about preserving their faith. And so as a result, they wanted to establish places of worship, which is a good thing, no doubt about it. But as I said, they weren't really learned people, okay? And often you found that they were, there, there were community leaders that wanted to establish places of, of worship as well. And the, again, these community leaders, a lot of them weren't very religious themselves. They might be, for example, selling alcohol, you know, working in restaurants, selling alcohol. Mm. And, and especially in the Bangladeshi community, this is actually quite common. Mm -hmm. A lot of masajid have been set up by people who are restaurant owners. And so, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're doing things which, I mean, selling alcohol is, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing. I mean, it's not a simple, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue, mm. okay? Um, and often you find, I mean, from my experience, I, I knew people that, that uh, weren't even praying five times a day. And they even admitted to that. Like, you know, I remember one time, a uh, particular member of a masjid, he was very senior in, in a mosque committee. He said, I don't know, understand how, how you guys pray Fajr prayer. And, and so we were like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, I, 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 never, I never pray Fajr. I, was, I can't get up on time, you know, so... And this is uh, someone who's seen in a, in a mosque committee. in a committee. So, so as a result of that, <coughs> the masajid, I think the majority of masajid and, and, and places of worship, they are run by people who do not have a vision to, uh, to not just safeguard Islam, but to propagate Islam and to bring the youth closer to the religion okay for them the mosque is a place to pray it's a place to establish themselves as community leaders it's a place by which they want to safeguard what their parents or uncles or they want to just carry on that legacy so for them if the mosque is open and people are praying, and the donations are coming every Friday. Alhamdulillah, that's it. They'll be they'll be absolutely content with that. Anything beyond that, they might see as being problematic, because it will bring attention to the mosque. And as you know, a lot of people who are engaged in Islamic work are under the scrutiny of of various different organizations, whether it be the media or the government and what have you, whether it's rightly or not rightly, okay, unrightfully. Um, and so as a result, they don't want that pressure on them. 
So, for example, if it's a well-known speaker who might have been, men been mentioned in the media for saying something controversial, they don't want to invite a speaker like that. I'm not saying that's wrong for them not to do so. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, uh, as a result, there is, uh, th there is definitely a, a clash between those, who, those imams that do have that vision for the community and, uh, and those mosque committees. And so as a result, you find many imams, they don't choose to become an imam because they don't want to work with committees that have that type of understanding or vision for their particular... Which is most, right? Which is, uh, well, I mean, from my experience, it seems to be the most. Mm. Yeah. And uh, secondly, you know, a lot of committees are broiled in, 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 co in committee politics, in village politics. Mm. Which um, Bangladesh village politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. obviously is very discouraging for, for imams. And, uh, and there are other factors as well, such as the fact that most, and, and because, by the way, because the, 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 the most committees have that type of vision or outlook for the, for the masjid, they don't actually want um, active imams. They don't want imams that have a vision and that are popular with the people. Because they realize that imams that become popular end up becoming more powerful. Mm. And if the imams have a, a greater vision than the mosque committee and, you know, ends up being um, very popular, that will mean that the committee will be less powerful. And they don't like that. And that's why you often find many mosques, they prefer to, you know, pay their imams a low salary because they know that will only attract a certain crowd type of imam. Mm. Basically, they want an imam who leads the five prayers, does the basic duties and goes home and that's it and and you know uh, and listens to what the committee says and essentially is an employee okay he's essentially is an employee and doesn't have a role greater than that and so they're afraid i think in many ways of hiring imams that are of, of a greater caliber than that mm. uh, and i think that's the that's that's a, the problem that we're facing at the moment so given what you've said what was the system like, the masjid system like, in the time mm. of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Salaf? Yeah. And obviously going on from in, in terms of hi in history. Yeah. And what should it be now? As in, what for looking at that system, how should yeah. how should we learn from that? Well, for the the I've always, after I experienced uh, the the Imam position, I came to realize that the closest a person can. Uh, be to, to essentially taking the role of a prophet is, is through the imam position. Because the Prophet wasallam he wasn't specifically an imam of the masjid. I mean, we know he had all of those roles. The imam, the, the head of state, he was a general, he um, was a counsellor, you know, he was everyone. You know, he had all of those sort of qualities and characteristics. But being an imam allows you to um, to experience many of those aspects of, uh, of, of 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 prophethood, so you're leading the prayers, you're you know you're teaching people, you're giving advice to people, you're you're in, in, engaged in dealing with the needy and the poor, those who are sick and what have you. And so that's. Um, we can see that from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu I mean, if you look throughout history, I mean, I suppose, you know, when you read the biographies of great people, rarely do you find uh, it being mentioned that, you know, he was an imam of a particular masjid. You know, they'll say, yeah, he led the prayers. Hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's normal for, I think in history, that a lot of imams might have been they might have just had that basic role to lead the people in prayer, teach the people the Quran, and that's it. Okay, but the difference is those Muslim communities and those Muslim countries they they had scholars, they had um, institutions where people could offer more than just the Imam leading people in prayer. And, mm. You know, and a lot of the other to remember a lot of the scholars were based in Masajid. Okay, a lot of scholars were based in masjid. So in reality, the, the whole complex of a masjid 
it was far more effective than the, the way it is today. And for many scholars even today and people of knowledge, uh, it's very difficult now for, for people to, um, to be a part of a masjid and not be the imam. Mm. Okay, so it, it's rare to find, for example, or you have a situation, you have a masjid and you have like a visiting scholar or a student of knowledge that is regularly at the masjid. You know, it's rare to find that. Okay, so as a result, and that's probably due to so many other factors, whether it be work related, the, fi the, the sort of eco the financial situation of, 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 uh, of scholars and imams and what have you. So what we're left with is essentially uh, structures, building, masajid, where we have imams, many of whom can't speak English properly. And uh, they lead the people in prayer, do the basic duties, run the maktabs and the, the madrasas and what have you. But beyond that, you know, they don't do much more. Mm. Yeah. What should the vision of the masjid be? Because you're saying, obviously, yeah. they don't really have much uh, desire to do, achieve much of yeah. the salah. Yeah. What should it be then? Well, I mean, if you look at the masjid and Nabawi, we clearly find that it was a hub of the community. Mm. It was a hub of the community. It was a place where people come to learn. People come to pray. People come with their problems. You know, there are so many hadith. I mean, look the hadith of the Prophet Sallam. He entered the masjid and he found a, the Sahabi Abu Darda, I believe, who was uh, concerned about his, you know, financial situation. And the Prophet Sallam taught him some du'as to teach him that if you say this, this will help you. And so we we can clearly see that people would go to the masjid for, uh, you know, for reasons other than just praying. You know, it would it was a, a it was like a mustashfa. It was a it was like a hospital, but a mustashfa lil qulub. You know, it was mm. a hospital for for the hearts, spiritual hearts. That's I think you know it, it should be a hub for the believers from that perspective. But also in terms of community work as well, I think it's very important. Um, mosques need to be more engaged with the local communities, whether it be by helping the poor, engaging with uh, people of other faith communities, as well. Um, inviting people from outside the community into the masjid, having awareness programs and awareness days and weeks and what have you. Um, you know, they need to have that vision. And there are, alhamdulillah, a number of masajid that are beginning to have this sort of outlook um, and they do some fantastic work. Have you, know? you seen any masajid that you would recommend? Or any certain aspects of it that you would recommend? So that people have an understanding of what you're... I think, uh, I mean, East London Mosque, are, you know, is doing a very good job in the way that they, in terms of the services they provide the community. Um, you know, there, there are different masajid. I and mean, the thing is, with, with masajid, okay, <laughs> um, obviously a lot, a, lot, a lot of times you find certain masajid, they, they are labelled in a particular way. Mm. So say this masjid is a Salafi masjid, this masjid is a Sufi masjid oh, and yes, what have yes. you. So, you know, I think people of all sort of denominations, they have good, um, they are good services that they, that, they, that they do offer. I mean, I can't say I know one masjid which is, for me, it, it resembles Masjid al-Nabawi in terms of the model that they, that they had. Yes. But there are masjids that are, you know, are close to doing that in terms of offering that sort of outreach work and and what have you. Yeah. You know, uh, Ustad, I saw a picture of a masjid in Turkey. Ah, yes, I was going to mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. job opportunity. It was, a, it was like an advert for, for an imam. Not exactly. Oh, was that? Oh, okay. I, know, I, would, I would like to hear your thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, okay. And on top of that, there was a masjid, that, a picture that I saw, where you have the uh, musalla area. Yeah. And at the back, there's a small playground for little kids. Ah, yes. Okay, okay, okay. What would be your thoughts on both? Oh, things? that's amazing. I mean, that, I think, uh, a mosque. There was a picture of actually a, v a video of a mosque in Texas. Mm. Um, I can't remember which masjid that, that, that was. Um, and the brother was going round. It was a huge complex. Uh, yeah. Huge complex. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, uh, I think it's the Clear Lake is one of Possibly. So they've got like a dedicated gym, they've got canteen, they've got play area. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, that's, that's, that's what a mosque needs to be. You know, mm. They need to have those, those elements. Uh, I think in America it's easier though, Texas, because they have a lot of land. So <laughs> That's the thing, I was, that's why I said Western. Uh, Everything is big as well in America. Yeah, so. because the UK, we, we're still working towards, whereas I think they, they have a lot of the things that we want. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. want to achieve. I think in America, from what I've seen, they, mm. they definitely have that. 
uh, that community spirit mm. you know, in, in their masajids compared yeah, to mega mosques. Mega mosques. Yeah, 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 compared to a lot of the masajids in, in, in the UK. Um, so that's something that I think we need. Slowly, I think things are changing, mm. you know, slowly. I mean, I remember when I first joined the masjid, uh, so, you know, we had all of those negative points, you know, in, in our mosque committee. Uh, so the issue of the outlook, the issue of internal politics and what have you. And um, so I, I, I was, I was f a lot of people advised me that it's going to take a few years, maybe even decades before you can start changing it according to your vision. But cha the changes happened quite rapidly. I think within a year, a lot of the things changed. And people were really shocked and, uh, and amazed at how we were able to, to change things within the masjid. Um, and just prior to, 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 to the whole committee being kicked out, <laughs> you know, it, if you were to compare it to the, the way it was in the beginning, I think, um, alhamdulillah, you know, we, we, we were able to achieve quite a bit, you know, a fair amount within a short period of time. So things are changing. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a time where our committee just consisted of young professionals, all like-minded, and most of them were actually even born in the UK, uh, which is... Um, in many ways, I think quite unheard of. Mm -hmm, definitely, you know, definitely. and yeah. didn't last uh, as long as we thought it would. But <laughs> alhamdulillah, at least that's, uh, that's uh, there's, a, there's a spark there of, of hope. Mm. Yeah. What was the second one, though? You know, you're saying how the job thing. Ah, yes. Yeah, so this was uh, this this was a uh, an advertisement that went viral, uh, mm. uh, about maybe about about ten years ago. Okay. Um, and it was um, it was a job advertisement for an imam for the. For the for the main mosque in Istanbul, um, and the qualifications or the, re the the requirements were so they obviously they have to be hafiz of Quran, have to learn Arabic, but also they have to be scholars of the of the Bible and the Torah. Scholars. The scholars, yeah, yeah. I mean, they have PhDs as well. In well, in those days, it would have been meaning they would have to have been you know learned basically. Okay. Um, they have to be, you know, masters of chivalry and, you know, they know how to ride a horse, a handsome appearance, a good voice, you know. Um, you know, so these were like tremendous... Ten years ago this was? No, no, this was... F sorry, the, 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 the post went viral, but it was actually from a, maybe a few, a couple of centuries ago. Okay, okay. Yeah? Yeah, okay a couple that, yeah, of yeah. centuries ago. So, um, and that just goes to show, you know, how in those days, like, to be honest, I haven't verified whether this was, this was actually, actually, I remember now, it was originally published in an Egyptian newspaper. Okay. Yeah, it was originally published in an Egyptian newspaper, Al-Ahram. I tried to find the source for it, actually, in the archives, but uh, I couldn't find it. But anyway, well, I didn't verify it, but I think it's genuine. Allah, I think it's genuine. But if it is, I think it reflects um, the, how people understood what the role of the Imam was. You know, and um, how he wasn't just a person to, to, to lead the people in prayer. As well as the level of scholarship that's yeah, available out exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and as, as, interestingly, though, if you, if you, for example, say here in Egypt, most of the Imams here, they have a fairly basic role, mm -hmm. meaning it's mainly just to lead the people in Salah and give the khutbah. Okay, they're there to offer people advice and what have you. But they're not really community leaders. I think one of the reasons is due to the, the political climate. That's one issue. But also because they have other bodies and institutions that can provide that, you know, that Islamic advice and offer that work. So they have like, you know, Wizarat al-Awqaf, Ministry of Endowments, and uh, where they focus on religious um, activities and projects and ifta and what have you so when you combine both together you can have quite an effective force but mm. in the uk you know we don't have that we don't have a religious ministry in that in that sense we don't have a unified body and so therefore it becomes even more important that the masajid do actually become the hub of the of the community hub in what sense though as in allow what and to what extent so it's a hub where people come to uh, obviously to offer their basic worship but to um, to be active members of the community okay so for example so I, in, in the UK I live in, in, in Victoria so I actually moved to Victoria in uh, 2009 
and uh, I joined the masjid in 2015. Mm. So between 2009 and 2015, I can say that because there was no real masjid in the area, I didn't know really anyone. And the, my work was always based outside of central London. And so I didn't really know many people from the community. So subhanAllah, so after establishing the masjid, I, I obviously I engaged with the people in the community and I had met people that I had never met before. <laughs> You know, and uh, and to my surprise, there were people who were so like-minded that were literally living just a few hundred yards away, mm. a few hundred meters away, or you know, or just just under a mile away, and they were all there. But I ne had never had known, and so the the mosque it brought people together. It brought people together, and when you bring people together, you're bringing ideas together. You're bringing problems. You're sh people are sharing their problems and their concerns. You're helping one another, so that's a hub. You know, it's a place where people come together to share their experiences, their worries, their concerns, development, and you know, and, and building relationships and, and networks. You know, in terms of our resources, our efforts, our finances, our time, where should we invest? Uh, in terms of, should we invest in the people or in the mm. youth or yeah. in the infrastructure or what aspect of the massage should we start investing or everything or? Well, I think. Um, Obviously, clearly, we, as, as communities, we, we clearly already invest in, uh, in building masajid. Every so often you'll hear of uh, a campaign to build a mosque or to renovate a mosque, which is good, alhamdulillah. But, um, you know, there, there needs to be more thought applied to investing in people and uh, rather than just investing in structures. Because at the end of the day, you know, a beautiful minaret is not going to guide our youth you know it's it's people of learning it's people of of tarbiyah it's people of ilm they'll be able to provide that guidance um, but they need to be supported you know they need to be supported financially whether it be by uh, you know setting up uh, programs to help and send people abroad you know i think that's a great initiative like a student support unit uh, where they fund students to go abroad in, and uh, and with the aim of them to come back um, to help other people, you know, to, to engage in da'wah. And to be honest, a lot of uh, senior du'at, they were put on programs like that, meaning they were funded to go abroad oh. uh, to, with, the, with the idea to come back and to, to help the community. So, um, and we need more initiatives like that, I think. Uh, we need uh, the thing is you really have to there needs to be a proper vetting process to put people on 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 such programs because at the end of the day a lot of people will jump at the chance to get a sponsorship to study abroad of course but they will have no intention in their mind to go back and um, want to benefit other people or want to share their experience and knowledge with other people so what what I think we need what what massages need to do is um, start looking at investing in in, in, in projects like that where they set up a project which to, to send students abroad, to, to get them to learn Arabic and memorize the Quran, understand it well, put them on some sort of uh, uh, programs where they learn uloom, where they learn Islamic sciences and you disciplines. You mean here or back home? Here or back home. Obviously here you have, to, uh, again, because to be able to, to, to learn Arabic, because Arabic is a key, you know, it really is a key, if you want to become a, a learned person. If you want to be just a practicing Muslim, uh, praise alhamdulillah, you know, you might not, it's not it's a, an absolute must to learn Arabic, but if you want to become a person of knowledge, then uh, Arabic is a must. And so to, to be able to learn that, it's going to be very difficult to learn uh, in the UK. Mm. Um, although I don't discourage people, if you have the option to learn in the UK, whatever you can learn in the UK will be of immense benefit when you come here. And, and even if you don't intend to come to the UK, whatever you learn of Arabic will, will be beneficial to you. So I don't want to discourage people from, from learning Arabic. But otherwise, as I said, I think mosques and Islamic institutions need to have those programs to fund students, whether it be in, in, here in Egypt or other parts of the Muslim world, or even in uh, full-time institutions in the, in the UK. Um, on, on condition, those institutions um, are able to provide students with that vision of being um, people of influence and, and, and people of change. Um, uh, do you know of any programs? Most programs are
quite academic in the, in their nature. I mean, sorry, in terms of like sponsorships for people oh, who okay. want to come aboard. Well, there were some in the past, but they stopped. Mm. And I think that's because of, again, issue of political climate here in the Muslim world. Um, but there were programs like that. And so even the program that I was on, it was, it was geared in that way. So, you know, alhamdulillah, we were sponsored to, 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 to a great extent, you know. Uh, although I had to, I had to, do, you know, I had to raise my own funds for, for a number of issues, uh, especially to buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can't say I, I, I know of a, um, I mean, you have projects like for learning Quran, learning Arabic language. So even if you're just sponsoring people to do specific things like that, then that's good, mm. you know. But I think um, the larger Muslim institutions and mosques, they need to think about setting up their own programs. For example, if they were to send people to, say, Egypt, they will have people here in Egypt that will take care of them, look after them in terms of teaching them Arabic, teaching them ulum, sharia, uh, and to teach them uh, matters of tarbiya. Um, and it's not a difficult thing. It's not that hard. Mm. They just, you know, uh, you just you, obviously you need the infrastructure for that. So you need the money. You need the setup. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we need to see that. You know, definitely more of that. Come back to the the, the committee. Let's say, yeah. is there a way you could say you can scrap the committee system entirely in in the UK? Let's say, or even in the West. I mean, is there an ideal way a masjid can? You know, run? Subhanallah. I remember. There was a Dar al Ulum mm. in uh, somewhere in Kent. Yep. Mm. And uh, one of our local Musallin, he, he used to go there. So he knew the, the Shaykh of the, of the, the Mawlana of the Dar al Ulum. And he, he, he mentioned something interesting to me. He said, uh, there was, in the Dar al Ulum, they have an open Jumu'ah, so people from outside can come and attend. And uh, after one of the Jumu'ahs, a person stood up. And made a and made a complaint openly to the to the imam. I can't remember what the nature of the complaint was. But he mentioned something alongside committee and decision and what have you. So the the, the Maulana he just said, Look, we're the people of knowledge. We run this place. We know what our principles and values are. You're clearly not a scholar, okay. So you just stay in your own name, basically. <laughs> so he just shut him up and just said, look, just sit down. Yeah? And, and the reason why the brother mentioned that story to me, because he was actually involved in another mosque dispute elsewhere in London. This was a massive dispute in a okay. big mosque. Um, there was an internal conflict between other denominations. Oh, I think I know who you're talking okay, about. <laughs> yeah. okay. And so this brother was, was heavily involved mm. because he, I think he was a quite a wealthy brother, mashallah, and I think he financed a lot of the, you know, the project. Um, and, uh, and he said, look, you know, the, 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 the only way we can solve this problem is if we get rid of the, these, uh, these uh, irreligious committee members and have the imams lead. Okay, so the Imam is the actual Imam. Okay, he's not just like a, a stooge or a you know a puppy, uh, a, you know, for the a puppet for the um, for, for the for the chairman. Okay. Yeah, and um, now that model, I think it's a very difficult model because the reason being is because being an Imam is difficult enough as it is. Yeah, to be the director and the Imam, I think that's. Uh, you know, in certain maybe small masajid, it could work. Okay, in bigger masajid, I think um, that is too much work for mm. one person to manage. Okay, but what I think is uh, there's no harm having a separate committee. There needs to be a committee. You, know? you can't have the imam just dealing with the finances and all of that all in one. It's just too much work. There needs to be a committee, but I think the imam needs to um, have greater power. In, uh, in, in the running of things because the reason, uh, to be honest, a lot of the disputes that arise in masajid, in mosque committees is due to the fact that there are people who are saying and doing things which are not Islamic so there are people who are vying for power people who will be backstabbing others stealing will take place yeah, so this is very this happened in our mosque, there were a couple of incidents where money was stolen 
And so all of these, these are the things that, 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 that lead to the disputes and to the you know, village politics. Mm. The, way, the way you can eradicate that is by having learned and religious people and people who are known for their adherence and their practice of the religion, they be the ones who are in charge. So I think that, you know, that needs to be done. And so, but I think uh, the problem is, is being a committee, and this is one thing well, I have learned over the years, is um, being a committee member is a very prestigious thing for people who are, who are hungry for status. You know, to be able to say, I'm a mosque committee member, um, I mean, for, for, I think for a lot of younger people, we would actually run away from that chance. If, if I was asked to be a committee member, I would say, look, I don't want that. It's a difficult responsibility. It's not a privilege. Okay, it's a responsibility. Mm. But for people who are, are older than us, they see it as a privilege. It's something which gives them greater status. They won't know anything about running a place. They won't know anything. About, I mean, there was times where our... Um, our treasurer <laughs> uh, could barely speak English, mm. was clueless about finances, didn't know how to use a spreadsheet. Okay, how could you expect such a person to be a treasurer? Mm. You know, made no sense. It actually made no sense. And so, you know, we had people like that, you know, in, in those positions. And so, you know, that, that needs to change. And that generation is dying out. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think that generation is dying out. And uh, may Allah reward them for the good that they did in terms of establishing the masajid. Mm. That's one thing that cannot be denied. Mm. You know, um, at the, you know, no, no matter how much negative things we can say about that generation, uh, they've done, they've achieved things that we haven't achieved. That's very true. You That's know, true. and uh, so we need to respect them from that perspective. You know, we need to respect them from that perspective and and uh, give them that credit where it's due. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes we are a bit too. Uh, what's the word? We feel like we're entitled. Yeah, so yeah, just yeah, keep yeah. The attitude. yeah. Sadly, exactly. Yeah. What would what would be the what would you say should be the power dynamics of the masjid? I mean, mm. generally speaking, obviously the imam should be given a lot more yeah. power. But being a bit more specific, what would so you? So, for example, you know, um, <clears throat> I give an example. There, there was a there, there was a time when I was the imam that if I wanted to. Uh, have a class established, or if I wanted to give out a particular message to the community which was important, it had to be agreed by the committee. Yeah. Now, that's for me. That was it. it didn't make sense for, for, due to our particular committee setup. The reason being was our committee. There was no one in our committee at a particular stage that was learned. All of them, maybe apart from one, could read, couldn't even read the Qur'an. They couldn't even read the Qur'an. Couldn't read the no, Qur'an. they couldn't read the Qur'an. Okay. Yeah, they couldn't even read the Qur'an. By the way, this, I would assume, would be for a lot of masajid as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, a lot, I don't know, it's difficult to say. Um, but it, it would just so our situation, mm. that, that, you know, uh, nearly everyone there couldn't read the Qur'an. And so for me, you know, come on. As an as an imam who, who's you know who's who's been studying Sharia, who knows Arabic and what have you, to go to these people and ask them, you know, can I teach this particular book? Okay, if I want to teach somebody other salihin, they will be clueless. Mm. What do they know what the other salihin is? Mm. Okay, they don't know. So you know and and so it made no sense why seek permission from them and that's why what interestingly what happened was uh, one of the things that i wanted to do as an imam was a was establish a library in the in the back of the masjid mm. okay and uh, we'll have bookshelves okay so they were really reluctant to do that a library yeah yeah a very library yeah yeah <laughs> very reluctant because you know why Yeah, you know, they say you know um uh, ignorance breeds uh, fear, you know? um, and uh, is a, there's a proverb in Arabic, an insan and that you know, majahil, or that people are, they'll be, they will show enmity to you as long as they're ignorant. Yeah, so because they don't know, mm. you know, we're, naturally when we're unaware of something, we don't, we don't know the reality of something, we naturally fear it. Mm. Okay, that's a, so they were like, okay, have a library. Um, 
Okay, let's just put hadith, books of hadith and Quran and that's it. Nothing else with commentary. So they said like books like Zakir Naik and these other, you know, that's all they knew in terms of Islamic figures. They, they weren't really aware about the okay. Zakir Naik, as we know, is a, is yeah. a popular figure. Mm. Um, so they said, we don't want anything like that. And, and, it, and clearly it's because of ignorance. They don't know. Okay, I mean, if I was to put, say, Tafsiri bin Kathir, they'll be like, you know, what's that? Mm -hmm. We're not, we, we haven't heard of that. So, okay, look, because we don't know anything about it, let's not do it. And so you find that that attitude is quite common in a lot of masajid because they don't know. Okay, and that's why, why do you think that a lot of masajid, they, um, they don't want, I mean, there was a time, I mean, the, ch check this out. There was a time where one of our imams, it was uh, Dhul Hijjah, and he wanted to mention the hadith about the virtues of Dhul Hijjah. Okay, and these are the, f the famous hadith of uh, virtue of Dhul Hijjah that there, is no, there are no deeds that are more beloved to Allah in these, in these days, in the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Except of a person who leaves, fi sabilillah. Mm. Yeah, and then, you know. And, um, and so the brother was, a, the Imam was a bit worried, you know, could he mention that in a, in a, uh, in a khutbah? Because he mentions the word, you know. Mm, yeah. mm, 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 no. And um, and straight away the committee said, no, 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 you can't mention that word in the khutbah. You can't mention that word in the khutbah because that would just bring pressure on us. But look at the context of the hadith. Clearly it has a very specific context. Now, again, because of ignorance and because of a lack of understanding of, of how to deal with these topics, we, they just want to you know, close the door on anything that can potentially you know, raise concern or raise eyebrows. But the great danger of that, that has, you know, people think that's beneficial to do that. Just keep quiet and nothing, mm. you know, we won't bring any heat to ourselves. But if the Imams who have a good understanding of the religion don't tackle these issues and address these issues on the minbar, who is going to address these issues? Mm. It's going to be the, the, you know, the fiery preacher on, online who will you know, doesn't know much Arabic and every time he quotes the Quran he's making mistakes and you know and uh, giving the answers to the youth you know and that that's what happens so in many ways this the attitude that a lot of these mosques take they're, they're making the problem worse they are making the problem worse um, um, you know by denying uh, you know scholars and, and imams from from being able to articulate Islam in the correct way it's just denying that outlet mm, but and uh, it's making the problem worse. You know, I've seen, I've seen obviously with the, let's say our, the first generation, the second generation yeah. of immigrants that came to the UK. I mean, I've seen that with, because of the culture, obviously they feel like because they've come to this country, that, you know, this is not our country, so we can't speak up, we can't say anything, we just pray and go. But yeah. obviously as we've been brought up, we know, I mean, that's not as simple as that. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think that's the other issue. So a lot of mm -hmm. people have a very uh, limited way of understanding the religion, mm -hmm. in a, a limited way in the way they understand the religion. In many ways, it's, you could say, quite secular in the sense that um, they believe that Islam is just to pray and fast, and that's mm -hmm. it. Anything beyond that is just... Uh, is, is, uh, it's not, not that it's not right, but they, 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 they don't want to enter into that, into those other areas. Would you say there's just, just generally, keeping this open, would you say, uh, would you, uh, or is there anything else you would want to uh, comment on in terms of how a masjid could improve, generally speaking, or yeah. how much could actually, you know, uh, go forward? Yeah, I think firstly, uh, practicing Muslims need to be more involved in masjid, whether it be in terms of, you know, becoming a imma, or whether it be practicing Muslims becoming more involved in helping the running the masajid. So, you know, these should have genuine good intentions to want to benefit the community, volunteer in the in the, in the masjid as much as you can, because at the end of the day, it's be very, it'll be very difficult for a person to join a mosque committee and shape the vision of the mosque if you're unheard of within the community. So, you know, if you work to become more, uh, more of an integral part of the, of the mosque by volunteering, by assisting and helping in the, in the running of the mosque, that will help immensely. You know, it will, it will give you a greater footing 
in uh, in the say of the, the running of the mosque in the future. Yeah, I remember recently though, my local masjid, yeah. it's quite a big masjid, Shaykh used to teach tafsir yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Whenever I used to go to, I, I don't know, I was, in, I was still newly practicing, but I wanted to, you know, do something. Yeah. Whenever I tried to do something or I wanted to help out or yeah. I made a comment, I just get shut down. I understand that I was maybe yeah, yeah. It's quite naive of me, mm. but at the same time, obviously, that's the opportunity to shape me as a person, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's like I feel like you know many messages they don't give the opportunity in the first place. That's true. That's a barrier that 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 needs to that a person needs to overcome. Mm. And you know, for a lot of young people, I can understand that that's a, the sort of uh, dilemma that they're in. But they can you know if they if they show signs of maturity. And responsibility slowly they, they they can become more involved in the mosque mm. you know, but they need to sh to show that as I said you know it would be difficult for a, a mosque committee to respect or or, or or you know respond to the view of a particular young person just like that you know they, they need to see they need to be able to trust that voice they need to be able to understand you know that what their motives are they need to see the maturity in your decision making so once they see that, you can slowly become m more involved and part of it. Okay, but it's not just a matter of, look, I want the mosque to do this. They're not listening to me, and that's it. You know, they're just irresponsible. No, you need to forge that relationship, mm -hmm. and that can take time. You know, um, uh, I was going to say something, but just my head. But come to another question. Yeah. How should generally, how should the Masajis just interact with the West, with mm. the politics that we're facing and just the climate we're facing? Yeah. How should they be? Well, one thing I think we shouldn't be so insular. Uh, a lot of masajid, are, they're in their own sort of own bubbles. They're not really concerned about what other people are doing outside the mosque. Mm. You know, they don't engage with their councillors. They don't engage with their local MPs. They don't engage with um, other faith communities. Okay, and that's that. I think that's where you know they, they need to focus on on those areas. So mm. when we were, for example. Um, we were very open com committee and so you know we were and i'm still actually involved in a in an interfaith group um it's not that in, in, because interfaith is interfaith is often misunderstood people think it's where and where people come together and they share their sort of perennialist thoughts and you know we all go to heaven so everyone is right and it's not mm. like that you know we we, re we rarely discuss religion we rarely discuss religion. In fact, there's only like a 10 minute part of our meetings where we read a script from one of the attendees and, they, and, and that's about it. The rest of the issues, we just talk about community issues, homelessness, uh, housing issues, security issues maybe, uh, you know, things like that. You know, we discuss uh, refugee crisis, food banks, you know, those are the things because you know, uh, places of relig religious institutions often are, are are dependent upon, even by the government in many ways, mm. to to solve these sort of social problems. So you know, I think it's really important that mosques get involved in these sort of projects. Um, you know, engage with counselors, invite them over. You know, let them become aware of the sort of projects that the mosque is is doing, um, because then a lot of people come to the mosque with their problems. And they don't go to their counselors, for example. And mm. I, I had a number of times, for example, I, there was a Syrian refugee a family we had to help. Um, they, they had no carpet in their, in their home. Okay, they had no carpet, it was just wooden floor. And a lot of it was like broken wooden floor. Mm. And so the brother, he couldn't really speak much English. So he came to the mosque. So he didn't know that there are counselors that can help with these sort of issues. So we have to take that responsibility, mm. you know, and to, to help, to help. So, yeah, that's another thing mosques need to do, I think, focus on those areas. Get imams trained up in counselling. They need to be, um, they need to be skilled in counselling uh, people because that's essentially one of the roles of, of an imam. Um, and, uh, and those other projects that I mentioned, I think they should you know, look into those areas as well. I did, I mean, I remember what I was going to say, but I'll say that a bit later. Okay. Would you recommend imams also, um, obviously if they had time, try to also be businessmen or try to, you know, be involved in entrepreneurship? You know, being an, <laughs> being an imam, honestly, it takes over your life. Mm. Yeah, it does take over your life. 
Um, and it all depends on your setup. I mean, if you're like a part-time imam, then yeah, then perhaps you could do that. Yeah, you can. And I know, um, I know some imams are part-time imams. They have a number of businesses, very successful businesses. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, may Allah bless their businesses and their wealth. That's good for them, because at the end of the day, we know imams don't get paid that much. Mm. Yeah. So they need to do something else on the side. But if you're a full-time imam, it's, it's unlikely that you'll be able to be, to, to, to be an entrepreneur and, and, and engage in other sort of businesses. I think that would be very unlikely. Mm. Uh, I suppose some people will be fortunate enough to, to do that. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's very difficult to do that. Because as I said, it's so demanding. You know, you, you, you'll be most like if you're a full-time imam, yeah, it'd be very difficult. What about in terms of masjid? As an entity, should yeah. that be, uh, should they be involved in entrepreneurship as well? As in, obviously, more so I say it because of the lack of lack of it in our community as uh, as we see it right now. Hmm. So, should we be encouraging that as, as a mosque, and also should we try to be involved in it to some extent? I, I think uh, you know, I mean, one of the things we did actually was hmm. on, on our notice board. Part of the notice board was dedicated to local businesses. So local businesses could advertise, um, you know, their businesses through the through the masjid. Um, there were a couple of instances where a new grocery store opened up, and so we publicly, not announced it, but you know, we had like a WhatsApp notification. We would share that information like that. So I think mosques need to play an important role in in um, strengthening the uh, you know Muslim businesses. Um, and it's a great place to do so as well because obviously you know if uh, you know people like to 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 help businesses that are run by fellow muslims um and strengthen the community from from within you know many other communities the jewish community do that very well for example mm. uh, apparently they have like um it's an unwritten sort of code of conduct that you know if there's a, sh a jewish shop open there can't be another shop open on the same street mm. or something. I, mean, I don't know if it's true or not, but mm. I've heard things like that. So, yeah, I think uh, mosques can can play a role in, in in strengthening our communities financially. Well, come back to my question, though. You know, like we, we see with a lot of masjid, you did mention this earlier, but a lot of them, a masjid usually is run by a specific group of people from a specific demographic, mm. um, and because of that, that makes it a lot harder for, let's say. A Somalian brother who's entered now a uh, a Pakistani-dominated masjid yeah. for him to, you know, do. I mean, even get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, this was a dilemma we faced because mm. when the first, when the mosque was first opened, everyone was uh, Bangladeshi. Everyone in the community was Bangladeshi. Um, by the time the end of our reign, <laughs> it was very mixed. We had so we had Bengalis, we had uh, Moroccans. We had uh, a Bosnian brother. Mm. We had. Um, who, did we have any other nationalities in the committee? No, I think that was all. So it, yeah, so we had three different nationalities, mm. and um, and even the Musallin was very, very, it was very mixed, you know. So that's one thing we because we we wanted to keep our committee diverse. And, uh, and that's why a lot of people, when they entered the mosque, they couldn't feel that it had a, you know, you, you couldn't really label it. Mm. Oh, this is a Bengali masjid. Yeah. It's true that the imams were nearly always Bengali. Okay, so for example, I was the, the full-time imam. We had a weekend imam who was always Bengali. It happened to be the case that he was always Bengali. Not that we made it a condition. Mm. Um, there was a time where we had a, an Egyptian half Egyptian, half Egyptian, half Pakistani uh, Imam. That was uh, for a temporary period though. But I, I think it's important that there is diversity in mosques so that people do feel welcome. Okay. Um, but that's a very difficult thing to achieve mm. um, because of the way the mosques were set up. Because initially. they were, yeah, initially. So they were, it, they were very entrenched in their sort of cultural um, uh, in, in terms of the cultural background of, the, of, of those masajid, they were clearly established by specific ethnic groups. Okay, uh, now I think a lot of the times people want to keep it like that, not because they don't, um, they, not because they're necessarily racist, 
but they feel as though bringing in other elements or people from other communities could uh, could and it could make the it could destabilize the, the the setup of the of the committee. I'm not I'm not saying that's right, by the mm. way. Okay, uh, but that's what they fear. I'm just I'm just saying what they what, what they're thinking, and that's what they fear. And that fear. And that's why I think they they, they refrain from introducing other people people from other communities. Mm. A lot of the times it is pure racism. That's yeah, a lot of the times it is pure racism, mm. and they just uh, like I remember clearly when um, um, there was a clearly a very racist tone towards Arabs. Okay, uh, by Bengalis. By Bengalis, clearly, you know they said if you if you get any Arabs in your committee, you're going to destroy the uh, the, the mosque, basically, mm. and um, yeah. So th there was clearly elements of that, unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. Wow. In terms of um, funding, let's yeah. say for the masajid itself, how should they fund themselves? Most they, I think work. most masajid they do end up, uh, you know. Th um, Friday donations, obviously, the most important uh, way, way it's the most important way to, to, to raise funds for, for Masajid. Um, that keeps the mosque going, but unfortunately, if, if, if we really want to you know, up our game, we need to be raising more, in particular to fund the Imams. Okay? Because, to be honest, the, the, you know, the, type, the, the amount of work that a, a full time Imam does, you know, he should be on a salary of, you know, uh, you know, of at least thirty to forty thousand pounds a year. Mm. Okay, at least anything less than thirty, really, it is. It's. 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 It. It doesn't reflect the amount of work that an imam does. And um, so, obviously, they'll be able. To, they will need to raise more money. You know, for that. So they have other. There are other initiatives like, um, you know, uh, maktabs and um, madrasas, which can bring a lot of money if you have a lot of students. Um, that's one issue, um, but there are other ways, you know, like standing orders and, you know, um, specific fundraising events and mm. what have you. I mean, I'm no expert in fundraising, um, but um, but those are the standard ways, I suppose, that people raise money. Yeah, you mentioned maktabs, but you know, uh, that will be a very long conversation, and I want to have that with you off camera. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah. inshallah, another time. Inshallah, another time. Um, Obviously, we um, come to the end of the podcast. Mm. Before we do end the podcast, I thought that as you have your own platform right now, it's called Tawfiq Online Learning, yeah. right? Uh, I'd rather let's, let's hear it from you. Okay, so let, you know, let the people know what is it. Exactly. <laughs> so Tawfiq Online was established uh, December 2018. So the first sort of courses were launched in, in January 2019. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite young as an, as an institution. Um, it's an online. It's, pu it's an online learning platform, and uh, as I mentioned, through my experience as an imam, I was disappointed that the number of people that attend masajid is, is very low. People struggle to attend a lesson on a weekly basis. So I thought, let me just try it. So really, it started off as a trial. I'll be honest. I thought, let me see how it works if I was to put all my classes online, and um, you know, I was surprised. To to um, uh, so yes, so it was a, a, a trial just to see how many people would uh, would sign up. And alhamdulillah, I think the first time we did really well. My my target was to get 120 students, and we we achieved that relatively easily. Alhamdulillah. And the idea was to offer people um, Islamic classes online. But with with certain f characteristics and features. So, firstly, I, I wanted to avoid uh, intensives, weekend seminars, weekend courses, etc. For my experience in in both learning and teaching, um, the benefit is quite minimal in t teaching in such a way. You know, the saying was called "Man ramal ilma jumlatan thahab jumlatan." If you seek knowledge in one go, it, it goes in one go, mm. and um, you know, for many years, I think people have been in, in the West, in particular, that's been quite a popular way of learning. So weekend intensives or weekend retreats and what have you. But I just found that method not effective enough. So I thought, you know, it needs to be, you know, knowledge needs to be learnt gradually at a you know gradual pace over a relatively long period of time. So I had experience in in, in teaching. Um, in 12-week semesters, 
but I felt you know, I found that to be qu quite short. So I thought let's make our semesters at least 16 weeks. So some of my semesters are 16 weeks, some of them are 24 weeks, depending on the course. And these are lessons that are taught in the evenings online uh, through a platform called uh, Zoom. And we have a really, mashallah, really nice setup. And the audio and video quality is, is, is crystal clear. The, and the good thing is, is that it's not, these, these are not pre-recorded lessons. So a lot of like online platforms, they offer you sort of pre-recorded mm. lessons. And, um, you know, you can buy a whole course and just watch it at your own sort of pace. Mm. We didn't want to do that because from experience, again, um, people sign up to these courses, they listen to one or two lectures and that's it. They forget about the rest. I've done that myself so many times. Like, we've, I don't know if you heard of Udemy. Yes, I have. Udemy, yeah. Yeah. So I've, done, uh, I've signed up to a couple of courses. I think I've done one of each, <laughs> one lesson of each. And that's it. I've, honestly, I just forgot about it in the end. And mm. so uh, kept on procrastinating. And so what we do is that our lessons are taught live. They're recorded because we know that not everyone can attend every lesson live. And then the, 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 the recorded lessons are put on the student portal, but for one week only. So if you miss a lesson, you have one week mm. to catch up. After that one week, it's gone. Okay. And so that, that keeps the students really on the ball. Mm. Alhamdulillah. It really, really does. And a lot of them really appreciate it. Yes, we still get requests after one week. That happens sometimes. They say, look, I've been traveling. Can I get the link for the lesson? So we, we can accommodate that. Okay, we can accommodate that. But otherwise, that's the philosophy. It's live learning. It's very interactive. Um, it's, I'm constantly throwing questions and questions are being thrown at me as well. We have a chat facility. People can speak. I can see their videos, but we don't really use that feature. Uh, it's, you just see me. I've, uh, I can share my screen. So I, I annotate using a, a tablet on all of the documents. I have as a PDF or, um, you know, uh, just notes you know uh, that i'm writing so they can they can see that as well so it's a very very interactive way of learning and in terms of the subjects that we teach it's 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 varied you know we teach um grammar and like sarf uh, balagha fiqh tafsir hadith um so it's quite all-rounded from from that perspective the the curriculum is still being developed but the way we advertise courses is that you you, you do it you just choose a course that you want to study at a particular time. Over the years, it's going to be it's going to be developed to to being a proper structured um, curriculum, and that is structured in levels as well, uh, which we've started to do. Uh, but at the moment in time, people generally take up a course or two courses a week, and uh, alhamdulillah, we've had uh, two successful terms. We've had a one 16-week term and another seven-week term. That was a very short period of the summer break. Mm. But from September, we'll be starting again, alhamdulillah. So it's been quite successful and it's growing, alhamdulillah. Students obviously started off from just based in the UK. Now we have students from abroad, from Germany, Denmark, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, America, Canada, mm. Indonesia even as well. Mm. So mm. alhamdulillah, it's growing. What's your mm. long-term plan? With the so the long-term is to develop it further. Fur uh, you know, at the, at the moment, as I said, you know, the, the first term was really is just a test to see how it worked. Now I can see, alhamdulillah, it definitely has scope for it to, for it to grow, which will include um, obviously adding more teachers and um, adding more courses to eventually becoming a, a, a fully fledged um, like a seminary where you can study all of the ulum over a period of, 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 of a number of years. Mm. So um, there are places that kind of offer that like that already, but I think you know our uh, the, the, the fact that we focus so much on live learning and their interactiveness is what is what makes it quite unique and are beneficial. You, are you going to continue with any you know live uh, like face to face classes? Yes, uh, that's something that I mean, my wife, Allah reward her, she's always uh, put pressure on me to make sure that there is at least one class during the week that I teach in in person physically. So, alhamdulillah, I kept one evening free. To, to complete the tafsir. So I, I, I've, I have a lifelong uh, project to teach the whole Quran in depth, um, which will last me a few decades. And you know, we t it took us about 70 lessons to finish Juz Amma. Oh. We're in Surah Baqarah now. We've done about 100 lessons in Surah Baqarah, and we're on verse 230 something. 30 something. 
So I teach that on a Wednesday evening at a small masjid in uh, masjid in uh, Vauxhall, the uh, EMCA, Eritrean Muslim Community Association, also known as Masjid Najashi. So that will resume, inshallah, on, uh, on, uh, in September, yeah. inshallah, from Surah Baqarah. We did Surah Ibrahim just before, between Ramadan and um, the summer break. If anyone wants to join Tawfiq Learning, how do they, how do they get So Alhamdulillah, we're, we're on all, so we have website, tawfiqonline.org. Tawfiq Online says T A W F I Q online.org. We're on uh, Facebook and um, not as much on Twitter, but we're also on Instagram as well. So we're on those platforms. So, Hamda, registration is almost finished for the upcoming term. So, people are listening and they want to register for this September 2019. There are still places on the Ajrumiya, Balagha, and the Fiqh courses. Uh, Quran course, course classes, we have a Quran study class that just got filled up straight away. So we have over 100 students for that, for, oh, you wow. know, so for that class. Uh, if we kept it open, we could have had a lot more, but mm. we can't manage more than that. It's, it's just, otherwise, it's too many. It will affect the quality of the teaching. Mm. So, um, so Alhamdulillah, there's still four other classes that people can sign up for too, inshallah. Barakallah yeah. Ustad for ahead. coming all the way out Alhamdulillah. here. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Guys, pleasure. if you want to um, get a hold of Tawfiq Online Learning, I will put it in the links below. And you know the, you know the rest, share, like, subscribe. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.